Hey students, I just wanted to sort of give you a lecture video to kind of finish out where we didn't finish um, dealing with imperialism. Um, we left off actually dealing with the insular cases. The insular cases were court cases where they were determining whether or not the uh, citizenship actually followed the flag, as they say. Um, basically, do people in these new territories get citizenship right after they become prop the territory becomes property of the United States. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that no, it didn't, and that Congress had to sort of give that right to those people a little bit later on. And we see the Jones Act, the Four Acre Act, that actually carry that on. Now, this was these cases came from a group called the American Imperial Anti-Imperialist League. We mentioned them, particularly the prominent people, Mark Twain, Andrew Carnegie, um, William William Graham Sumner was another one that was important, William James, um, and of course William James Bryan, um, that they were important there. Um, Anti-imperialism really was growing uh, at this time. And if you're looking at the PowerPoint, which you should be going along with the PowerPoint with this video, you see it kind of shows you an image and that flag that Mark Twain said that had the Jolly Rogers where the star field is. Of course, 19... Uh, 1901, that's when the first insular cases hit. That was also the year that our president ended up being assassinated. Uh, William McKinley was assassinated by an anarchist. Uh, he was shot while at the World's Fair in Buffalo, New York. Um, ironically, a lot of the tools they may have needed to save his life, like the x-ray machine, um, were available there, but they did not use them, and he ended up passing away. So Theodore Roosevelt ends up being president of the United States. Now, McKinley was our first imperialist president, and, and um, he actually gained, we gained the most territory during his presidency, but Theodore Roosevelt's going to do more to sort of increase the prestige of our nation. Um, so, again, throwing the PowerPoint, it shows that. So, Theodore Roosevelt becomes our, our president. Um, after McKinley, we have three presidents that we... So we have four total um, imperialist presidents. McKinley's the first, but we have three more. And these three presidents, they're all going to have a diplomacy that's sort of tailor-made for them that they started. Um, and you see in the chart in the PowerPoint that next we have Theodore Roosevelt with big stick diplomacy. Then we have William Howard Taft with dollar diplomacy. And then we have Woodrow Wilson with moral diplomacy, also known as missionary diplomacy. And going through this, we got to talk about that. Now, we'll start with Theodore Roosevelt. Y'all know he's my favorite president. Um, he His policy is called Big Stick Diplomacy. Big Stick Diplomacy is sort of derived from this West African proverb that Roosevelt used from time to time. It said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Okay, essentially with big stick diplomacy, we're going to build up that strong military and we're going to use it to make people not necessarily go against us. Sometimes it's viewed as deterrence. Um, you might even call it militarism. Okay, but we're going to build a strong military. We're going to show it off. Um, there's some examples of big stick diplomacy, the Great White Fleet. Uh, it started in 1907 through 1909, where we sailed around the, the world showing off our battleships. But ironically, those battleships were sort of obsolete, and, you know, we were just making a show of force. But that's an example of big stick diplomacy. Other example of big stick diplomacy is during the Panamanian Revolution, we just sort of adjacently park our ships near Colombia, and the Colombians don't intervene when uh, Bunabari is leading his uh, revolution in Panama. But these are examples of big stick diplomacy. This big stick diplomacy really kind of takes us from that isolationism to interventionism. And Rose Theodore Roosevelt's really the president that's going to push that. McKinley, we started because remember we intervened in Cuba. That was the whole reason for the Spanish-American War, but now we're going to carry it forward with Theodore Roosevelt. Okay, so big stick diplomacy. Um, sort of the objective of the big stick diplomacy is to keep Europe out of um, Latin America. We're going to add, or Roosevelt's going to add what's called the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine that adds to our foreign policy. Now we are going to be intervened if issues come up in Latin America, and that's what that does. And it really sort of 
they call it the constable of the world. That's one of the political cartoons. Basically, we're like the traffic cop of Latin America now. So we're going to use force when needed to defend American interests in Latin America. Now, Roosevelt starts this policy, but it's carried on through with William Howard Taft. He commits U.S. troops and Woodrow Wilson, who also, Wilson actually does it more than anybody else. So it's interesting to see, but this big stick diplomacy, this idea of strong military and interventionism in Latin America, that's what big stick diplomacy is. Now let's talk a little bit about the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. If you're following along on the PowerPoint, you see this um, political cartoon. We can see Roosevelt, and you know how I say in class, look at this cool ship, look at this big gun, isn't it cool? Wouldn't it be bad if it's aimed at you? Well, this cartoon literally sort of embodies that. You see uh, the Dominican Republic is crying there. Europe is holding something that says claims. Okay, that's because Europe has claims against the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic owes them money. Well, what the Roosevelt Corollary says is that no nation can in Latin America, if they go into excessive debt, which causes them to be sort of able to be controlled by European power, the U.S. is going to step in. And this is used repeatedly for the U.S. to intervene. The first place we do that is in the Dominican Republic. We do it in Cuba. We do it in Nicaragua. Uh, we do it in Venezuela. We do we do it in all these places during this time period, during the age of imperialism. And we have those uh, those presidents in charge of that. So if there's an issue with Latin America with a European nation, we end up being sort of the go-between for them. And that's the, the, the Roosevelt Corollary is going to stay in there until World War II, okay? And in the PowerPoint, there's just various political cartoons that show this. Make sure you're able to recognize the symbols that you can recognize Theodore Roosevelt and the symbols, the ships, and always look at the labels of those political cartoons. They're going to help you out. Okay, also it talks about the Great White Fleet, which we've already talked about. It's a show of force. I mean, it's a goodwill, a goodwill tour that we go around the world, but what we're doing is showing off, okay? And in that PowerPoint, I gave you a picture of the BB-23, the USS Mississippi that was part of the Great White Fleet. It's kind of cool. There's a part of it on the state capitol grounds down in Jackson. If you're ever there, go see it. Um, and also, I show you that picture that it, it got sunk by the Germans in World War II. We sold it to the Turks or not long after after it sailed around the world. But it, you know, it lived on for a little while. Then the Germans got it. Um, and then it just shows there's a good bit about the Great White Fleet in the PowerPoint. But just know that's an example of good big stick diplomacy. Um, it's a deterrent. We're showing off, basically. We're showing these ships. Why else would we just randomly send ships around the world? Because we can. And then we shift over to the Panama Canal. Panama Canal is a big, big issue kind of throughout American history starting starting after the California Gold Rush. Um, remember in the last unit we talked about the Transcontinental Railroad was required or, or desired because we needed to get the gold from California very quickly. We needed to get it across the country so that we could um, safely get it into our treasury. Otherwise, it was having to sail around the, the uh, southern tip of South America, which is a long trip, but also a dangerous trip. And I told you about the SS Central America, the, sh the gold ship that sank, that when they found it in the 80s, it was estimated a billion dollars worth of gold was on that ship. So we needed a way to more safely get the gold back. Well, in the 1850s, they said, hey, let's build a canal because railroads weren't real. In the 1850s, they were not super reliable, and it seemed like a transcontinental railroad was an impossibility at that point. Although we started working, you know, with the Southern Pacific trying to do that in the 1850s. It, it didn't pan out then. And we'll get the Transcontinental Railroad in the 1860s. So the canal idea is pushed back, okay, because the railroads are great. And after the Civil War, we have 25 years of relative peace. We're not involved in a major war at all during that time. And so we kind of let it pass by. Well, in the 1850s, we made a treaty with Britain. It's called the Clayton Bulwer Treaty. Clayton Bulwer Treaty. And this basically says that Britain and the U.S. will share the building of a canal. 
in the Isthmus of Panama. It doesn't say where it's going to be other than the Isthmus of Panama. So that's anywhere between the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico all the way down to Colombia in South America proper, okay? Well, so we just kind of sit on that. The British don't do anything with it. We don't do anything with it. We're, we're just kind of there. And enter the skip ahead to 1898, the Spanish-American War, after, and this is eight years after Alfred Mahon wrote his book, which talked about a canal. Spanish-American War highlights the need for a canal like that. Okay, the Spanish-American War basically shows us we've got to be able to move our ships quickly from one coast to the other. That shore defense is tough stuff. And so after the Spanish-American War, this really becomes an issue, particularly because we end up with our youngest president ever, who is Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt becomes president. He's 42 years old. He actually had read Mahon's book. Remember, he was assistant secretary of the Navy, and he says this this is an issue that we need to get on. Well, meanwhile, the French in 1899, they started building a canal in Panama. It was a failure because the workers died. They died of yellow fever, malaria. The area that they picked to build it was relatively swampy along the coast. There were mountains to overcome, but it was sort of the dream of this engineer. He was a French and Panamanian engineer. His name was Felipe Bunabarilla, okay? And this was his dream, but it failed. But now there's hope for him because the U.S. is talking about possibly building a canal. Well, the issue is Panama is not an independent country at this time. It is a province of the nation of Colombia. Also, um, as we start looking at the feasibility of building a canal, there's, there's two p potential sites. One is in Nicaragua, which is where Cornelius Vanderbilt proposed the original canal idea. And he had actually worked on it. He had, they made the river more nav navigable for steamships at that point or steamboats. Um, it was not going to be as far a distance to dig as the uh, other site, which was where the French had tried in Panama. Okay. Well, Philippe, he basically convinces the Senate to choose Panama, and he does this by sending each of the members of the committee that was deciding a stamp with a picture of a erupting volcano on it. So they think, why are we going to invest all this money in Panama, or, or in Nicaragua, excuse me, and just have it filled up with lava? So they pick... Um, the Panamanian site. The problem is the Colombians do not want the deal that we offer them. We offer them an amount of money. We want a one mile wide uh, strip of land for a canal. Uh, we're going to pay them rent every year forever. They don't accept that deal. Well, Colombia, I mean, we kind of, we don't really have much incentive to build in Panama if they don't want to take the deal Shoot, we'll just go to Nicaragua, right? Well, Felipe Benabria, he's really desperate. This is his his baby, so to speak. And so he reacts. And what he does is he leads a revolution in Panama. Panama, which is a province of Colombia, we have the Panamanian Revolution. Um, and this Panamanian Revolution is relatively bloodless, in fact, the only documented death was a mule that belonged to a peddler who had all of the, the pots and pans and knives and stuff like that that he was selling on this pack mule. And a gun, like a cannon was fired nearby and the mule died of a heart attack. It's kind of a funny story. But the thing is, the Colombians let Panama go because of big stick diplomacy. See, we park naval ships off the coast near... Cartagena, which is a major port uh, in Colombia. And the Colombians, they just don't intervene. So Felipe Bunabarilla becomes president of the new Republic of Panama. Okay, And very, very quickly, we sign what's called the Hay Bunabarilla Treaty, which gives us access to the canal zone. But instead of being one mile wide, it's two miles wide. And we offer them more money and they, they accept it. 
Prior to this, we actually had what's called the hay pulse fort Treaty, which was with Britain. And what that did was Britain said we could build a canal. They, wouldn't, they weren't worried about it. So this sets the stage for us building the canal. Now, Roosevelt wants the canal to be an election issue in 1904 because he's going to run for president for the first time that he's running for president. Now, he remember, he's an accidental. He became president because of the death of William McKinley. So Theodore Roosevelt pushes for this to occur. And in 1904, we break ground. We break ground in 1904, and this starts one of the largest engineering projects in world history, okay? We build it. Theodore Roosevelt, while he's president, actually goes and visits the canal zone under control, under when it's um, under construction. It's one of the first times that a sitting president actually left the United States while they were in office. Um, it was also, we, did, we gained a lot of knowledge about mosquitoes and fighting malaria and yellow fever from the Panama Canal project. It's gonna take us 10 years to build this. Okay, when it's done, Theodore Roosevelt's not president anymore. It actually opens in July of 1914. Now students, do you remember what happened in July of 1914? It was a major cataclysmic world event, and that's the beginning of World War I. So it's completely overshadowed by that, but because it's there during World War I, it is a very good asset for the U.S. military. Also building off of this, we're gonna build stronger and stronger ships, larger ships, and this just really increases our prestige around the world. Like I told you, Theodore Roosevelt really did this. Now an aside, during our imperialism time, we gotta talk about something called the Russo-Japanese War. Doesn't involve us directly at all, okay? This is actually a holdover from the Boxer Rebellion. Remember we talked about Japan and Russia having a little issue about leaving Manchuria alone after that? It's the, the result is the second open door notes. Well, there's some bad blood between those two as they both claim the same island. There's an island called um, Sakhalin Island, which is, if you look at the archipelago of Japan, it would be the most northern large island. However, it was claimed by Russia and Japan. Russia wanted a year round open port on that in in asia they didn't have that now they their ports were too far north and they would freeze so they wanted the southern end of Sakhalin island japan wanted the whole island because they viewed it as part of the japanese homeland also bad blood over a railroad in manchuria during the boxer rebellion era leads japan to attack russia in 1903 um, they actually attack and destroy the Russian Pacific Fleet, okay? Well, Russia has massive, massive resources and they just call over their European fleet. And the Japanese attack it and destroy it too. Looks like Japan's winning, doesn't it? Except this little island nation, there's no way they're gonna win a large, long war with Russia. Russia has more resources. Not only that, they've got more allies. Remember, uh, the Romanov family, they're related to all the monarchs in Europe. They just call their cousin and ask for some more ships. So Japan smartly asks Theodore Roosevelt to step in and arbitrate an end to the war. Okay, Arbitration that they're going to negotiate, they're going to end this war. And so in 1906, we end up with what's called the Treaty of Portsmouth. Uh, the Russians and the Japanese, they come over. Roosevelt takes them out from Portsmouth, New Hampshire on the presidential yacht, and they negotiate and end the war. Now, Russia's pretty okay with the terms. Japan, however, is not happy because they end up sharing. Japan gets the southern half, Russia gets the northern half of Sakhalin Island. And this is just another one of those instances we've talked multiple times of things that the U.S. did that kind of ticked off the Japanese. Now, this is also two years before the Gentleman's Agreement happens. So, there's a lot going on. Now, the result of the Treaty of Portsmouth, it ended the Russo-Japanese War. It also makes Theodore Roosevelt super famous for his arbitration. When we talk about progressivism in the coming days, we'll talk about how he used arbitration, particularly dealing with um, labor unions and that. But this also 
allows Theodore Roosevelt to become the first U.S. president to receive the Nobel Peace Prize because he truly negotiated peace in that area of the world. So that's kind of cool. There's two other presidents that have gotten the Nobel Peace Prize, and we'll talk about them later on. Now, one of the things that Roosevelt, in 1904, he got, re he got elected. So he's going to serve in office um, from 1904 up till he leaves office in 1909. Now, he promises in 1904 not to run for president, and that actually helps him get elected because he's super popular, but he promises not to run again. And so he handpicks his successor, and his handpicked successor is his secretary of war, William Howard Taft. And William Howard Taft is going to take a different tact on diplomacy. He's still going to do some of the big stick diplomacy. We're still going to follow the Roosevelt Corollary, but he had something called dollar diplomacy. Dollar diplomacy. So dollar diplomacy is basically incentivizing banks to loan money to U.S. companies to invest in Latin America. See, if I owned a railroad and I wanted to build a railroad in a place like Argentina, a U.S. bank would be unlikely to loan me money because it's a lot of risk, right? Well, the thing is, what dollar diplomacy does is the government is going to guarantee to the bank any repayment of loans for investment in Latin America. So what that means is they are going to lend me money with less risk because the government says they'll pay that loan back. Even if there's a revolution in Argentina and all my stuff gets torn up or taken by a government or I get killed or whatever, that bank is going to get their money. So dollar diplomacy is to help build up the economies of Latin American countries. Why did we want to do that, though? If we build those economies, we are going to have stronger trading partners. It's a win-win. They're going to get a better standard of living. We're going to get more dedicated markets to, for our uh, manufactured goods. So that's the gist of dollar diplomacy. Like I said, Taft, of the imperialist presidents, he's just kind of the one in the middle. He doesn't do a, a ton. He does commit forces a few times under the Roosevelt Corollary, though. Okay, so then we move on to Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, you all probably remember from world history, U.S. president during World War I. Well, he entered office before World War I started, and it's going to be several years into the war when the U.S. enters. So he had a diplomacy style. It was called moral diplomacy, also known as missionary diplomacy. It just depends on what book you're looking at, okay? So his objective with this diplomacy was to support democratic governments, particularly in Latin America. So we're going to support democratically elected governments. We are not going to support oppressive or undemocratic governments. In fact, if a new government starts that's a dictatorship, we are not very likely to actually recognize that government, which causes a lot of problems. Now, under moral diplomacy or missionary diplomacy, the major nation that we look at is Mexico. In the 1910s, Mexico had some craziness go on. Basically, they had a duly elected president. His name was Madero. Madero was elected. However, a guy named Huerta, he leads a revolt, and Madero is arrested and put in prison. Huerta becomes the president, or declares himself the president, a dictator, basically, and Madero is murdered in prison. So friends of Madero, there's four of them. There's a guy named Carranza, there's a guy named Pancho Villa, and then there's Emiliano Zapata and Alvaro Obregón. They fight against Huerta, okay? They're like counter-revolutionaries because Huerta is like a revolutionary government, a dictator, and these counter-revolutionaries are working to undermine his power and government. Now, all this is going on, Woodrow Wilson's president, we don't recognize Huerta's government because Madero got murdered. And so this is an oppressive regime. We're not going to support that. <coughs> However, we do support these counter-revolutionaries. We support them in, to, in their trying to undermine Huerta. In fact, Wilson takes on something called 
watchful waiting. Essentially what that means, it's dealing with Mexico. We are watching what's going on in Mexico and waiting for an opportunity to act against the Huerta regime. Well, that opportunity comes in 1914. Some sailors get a little tipsy in a port town called Tampico on the Pacific coast. The constable in Tampico arrests them. It's about a dozen of them. They get locked up essentially for a drunken disorderly charge. Once the constable finds out that they're in the U.S. Navy, he releases them. But this has already given enough um, going against the U.S. to cause an incident. The Wilson administration, in retaliation for U.S. servicemen being jailed in Mexico, even if it was completely you know, justifiable, Woodrow Wilson, he sends the Marines, and they occupy the most important port in Mexico, a place called Veracruz. When Veracruz is occupied by the U.S. Marines, where to flees? Because Mexico City is not far from Veracruz. So where to flees? That kind of creates a power vacuum there, okay? And one of these counter-revolutionaries, a guy named Carranza, actually comes to power. Well, when Carranza comes to power, one of those counter-revolutionaries that we liked, guess what our government does? They recognize his government. Okay, so what's wrong? Yay, Mexico, it's all better now, right? Wrong. This really ticks off the other counter-revolutionaries because we just handed the everything to Carranza. And particularly one counter-revolutionary named Pancho Villa is particularly upset with the U.S., to the point that he and his followers stop some trains in northern Mexico and actually kill Americans on those trains. They even, in 1914, ride across the border into New Mexico and shoot up a town and kill about a dozen people on American soil. Well, can we as a nation sit back and allow that to happen? No. Even under moral diplomacy, Woodrow Wilson cannot let this stand. So... In 1915, it's called the Punitive Expeditions. The U.S. Army actually invades northern Mexico. We invade northern Mexico looking for Pancho Villa and his followers, the banditos, as they were called at that time. So we are looking for them. Now, the people of northern Mexico, they feel oppressed by the U.S. presence. They hide them, okay? As we get frustrated, we end up, violating the people of northern Mexico's rights a little bit more. And what this leads to is sort of a long, um, a long remembered distrust of the United States and northern Mexico. By the way, we never do find Pancho Villa, even though John J. Pershing, the general in charge of the punitive expeditions, actually knew Pancho Villa and had met with him multiple times, we never find him. In 1917, our troops are pulled out of northern Mexico, just in time for when we declare war on Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire in 1917. Now, moral diplomacy, remember the goal was that the U.S. is going to support democracy. Wilson viewed it as the U.S. being the conscience of the world. Okay, Our goal was to spread democracy, promote peace, and to condemn colonialism. And we will see all of these themes as we move forward into World War I. Woodrow Wilson, he will have his, in his war declaration speech, he said, let's make this a war to end all wars. Let's make the world safe for democracy. I mean, we see these themes through there. Also, when we look at his 14 points, his plan for peace after World War I, we will see these things echoed in that too. Well, imperialism, our imperialism comes to an end basically with Woodrow Wilson, our traditional imperialism, because we become preoccupied with World War I. Now, the crazy thing is during this time, the progressive era is going along at the same time, and that's going to be our next topic, okay? So again, this video, you should have been following along with the PowerPoint um, that's on Canvas. We started there with the Anti-Imperialist League and went to the end through the three imperialist presidents. 
Um, you need to make sure that you're doing all your assignments in Canvas. And um, I hope you have a great day.